Friends, you're joining us for the second in a series of videos about the issues that are dividing the United Methodist Church and why Methodist Christians who believe that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God and that the Bible is God's inspired word need to consider leaving the UMC for another Methodist Church that upholds these important beliefs. If you didn't see the first video, I suggest that you watch now. There's a link in the notes below and it's foundational for this video and the others that follow. When I speak to churches about the division within the UMC, I often begin by saying, if you do not know about our differences, what I'm about to tell you will make me sound like a crazy person. I'll be the guy shouting centuries ago that the world is round when you and everyone you know is certain that it's flat. If you've been in a United Methodist Church and you've had a good pastor who believes in the Bible, who preaches that Jesus died for our sins, and who teaches that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life, you're likely to think that's how it is throughout the entire United Methodist Church. So when I begin to tell you that's not how it is throughout the denomination and that many of our pastors and bishops challenge those very ideas, I know I can sound like I'm a bit of a nut, and that's why I will be quoting many pastors and bishops in the next three videos. So you'll be hearing their views in their own words. The most important division we have in the UMC is how we see Jesus, and that will be the focus of our next video. I promise you, you will be surprised and I think dismayed and deeply saddened by what you learn. Please be sure to watch. In this video, I want to talk with you about our differences regarding the scriptures, the Bible. The word Bible simply means book. We put holy before the term Bible because the word holy means set apart or different. And that's what Christians have believed for centuries. That's what Methodists have always believed. The Bible is a different kind of book. It's set apart from other books because it was inspired by God. That means it's authoritative. It tells us how to live, how to please God, and what is true spiritually and morally. You may have heard the Bible referred to as the canon. The root word for canon goes back to the Greek and it means rule or standard. Originally, it referred to a straight reed that was used as a measuring rod. And that gets at how Christians have always seen the Bible. It's the measuring rod that we measure all spiritual and moral claims by. If they measure up to what's in the Bible, we accept them. If they don't, we reject them. Why? Because the Holy Bible is a different kind of book. It's God's book. It's God telling us what's right and what's true. But that's not how many United Methodist pastors and bishops view the Bible. Years ago, at a past general conference, a United Methodist pastor from Iowa spoke in favor of liberalizing the current language in the discipline regarding sexuality. When asked how he could argue for a position that contradicted the scriptures, he stated, we don't go back to the Bible for the last word on anything. That was a United Methodist pastor in the Midwest. Let that sink in. We don't go back to the Bible for the last word on anything. When I began to work for my annual conference to elect delegates to general conference who were more biblical in their positions, we made a big difference the first time we tried. Shortly thereafter, a well-respected older pastor at a high steeple church in Houston called me up for lunch. He was so admired that he taught ethics courses at the Houston Medical Center. I was very impressed with myself. This highly respected pastor knows my name, I thought. I was pretty young, not at a large church at the time, and I thought, this man wants to get to know me. Nope, that's not what he wanted. It took no more than 10 minutes to figure out that what he wanted to do was to change me. And so he started telling me all the beliefs we needed to revise that the church had held on to for the past two millennia. Or, he said, we would lose the culture and become irrelevant. I listened, I think patiently, until he stopped talking. Finally, I said, I believe I understand what you're saying, but I can't go there with you because it's not what the Bible teaches. 
And then this highly esteemed United Methodist pastor at one of our largest Houston churches said to me, Rob, the church created the Bible so we can recreate the Bible. No, the church did not create the scriptures. We received the scriptures. And yes, it was a messy process, but no one except liberal Protestants in recent times have ever suggested that we could recreate the Bible to our own liking. And why do they feel they can do this? Because they believe they know better than the Bible. More examples for you. Progressive United Methodist pastor Tom Griffith in California wrote an article titled, Give a Cheer for Our Evangelical Brothers and Sisters. In it, he stated, now it is our turn to get honest, meaning liberals. Although the creeds of our denomination pay lip service to the idea that scripture is authoritative and sufficient for faith and practice, many of us have moved far beyond that notion in our own theological thinking. We're only deceiving ourselves and lying to our evangelical brothers and sisters when we deny the shift we have made. We have moved far beyond the idea that the Bible is exclusively normative and literally authoritative for our faith. He continues, To my thinking, that is good. What is bad is that we've tried to con ourselves and others by saying we haven't changed our position. Though I differ with him, I say hooray for Tom Griffith and hooray for that high-steepled pastor in Houston because at least they were willing to be honest about how they viewed the Bible. This is very different from the leading centrist pastors of the day who tell us they have a high view of the Bible, that they believe in its authority as much as we do. It's just they say that we interpret it differently. The pastor of the largest church in our denomination wrote a book in which he divides the Bible into three buckets, his term. One bucket for the scriptures that revealed God's will when they were written, and still do. Another bucket for scriptures that at one time expressed God's will, but no longer do. And a final bucket for those parts of the Bible that, quote, never reflected God's will and heart. Of course, the book doesn't tell us how or who will determine which parts of the Bible go into which bucket. Do we elect a pope to decide for us? Does the author feel sufficient in and of himself to determine those matters for the rest of us? Do we choose a tribunal that will sit in judgment of Scripture and speak from on high to folks like you and me? Or do we all decide for ourselves which parts we need to follow and which parts we are free to disregard? Believing the Bible can be divided in this way is not just a different way of interpreting the scriptures. It's an outright denial of what the Apostle Paul wrote in I Believe. 2 Timothy 3.16, Paul wrote, All scripture is God-breathed. All three buckets are God-breathed, God-inspired, and profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training. I must tell you that when it comes to the inspiration of the Bible, if I have to stand with the Apostle Paul, or with a 21st century pastor in a postmodern culture, I will stand with the Apostle Paul every time. Another United Methodist pastor, J. Richard Peck, wrote a particularly helpful and insightful article. It was titled, Church Should Examine the Reason for Its Differences. As a retired clergy member of the New York Annual Conference and a former editor of Circuit Rider and New Scope, Reverend Peck stated that before we can understand our differences on homosexuality, we must understand our differing attitudes towards Scripture. Listen to how he describes the divide. Quote, conservatives view Scripture as a single entity. They believe every book in the Bible is the inspired Word of God. They quote Leviticus and the letters of Paul with equal certainty. They are likely to assert the Bible says. Later in his article, he states, Nearly all conservatives say the Word of God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. No scientific claim and no change in social standards can alter the fact that every mention of homosexuality within that book is negative. Then he describes how liberals view the scriptures. Liberals are not as quick to dismiss the letters of Paul. That's very generous of them. They well know that Paul wrote some of the most insightful and inspirational passages in all of scripture. At the same time, they know that he was a product of his times. Now, when I read statements like that, I always wonder if liberals ever stop to think that maybe they believe what they believe because they 
are a product of their times, a time and a culture that is highly secularized and overly sexualized, a time where theology goes a little deeper than God is nice and we should be too, and a time when the highest virtue is tolerance, except when it comes to tolerating people like you and me. The article uh, continues. Peck writes, While liberals value the words of Jesus above all other teachings, even here they will distinguish between the early writings of Mark and the later and more theological writings of John. If there were teachings by Jesus in any of the Gospels about homosexuality, liberals would find these compelling and debate might be ended. Debate might be ended. If Jesus had said what they have determined he would have said and should have said. In other words, Jesus must be the Jesus they want him to be, and his thoughts must be their thoughts if he is to be valued as a source of truth. It reminds me a bit of the statement, in the beginning, God made man in his own image, and ever since we've tried to return the favor. Amazing, isn't it, that 21st century progressive theologians look back 2,000 years and discover that a first century apocalyptic Jew named Jesus, who claimed to be the Messiah, was actually a 21st century progressive theologian who has the very same woke views as they possess. Listen, those of us who are calling the church to orthodoxy, we know there are parts of Scripture that are difficult to interpret. We do not claim infallibility in our understanding of the Bible, and we humbly and gladly admit that we need the counsel of the entire body of Christ rightly to divide the word of truth. We need the witness of the historic church, and we need the insights of our contemporaries, those who agree with us and those who do not. But please hear this. We do not believe some parts of the Bible are the Word of God. We believe the Scriptures are the Word of God. We believe the Scriptures are more than the witness of godly men and women to God. We believe they are God's witness to us. And that means if the Bible contains it, it's not our job to correct it. If the Bible teaches it, it's not our prerogative to twist it. And if the Bible states it clearly and consistently, we don't need this month's copy of Psychology Today or the latest Gallup poll or some self-appointed pontificator of political propriety to tell us why the Bible got it wrong and how enlightened folk, folks like them, have now got it right. Please hear this. We choose to stand under the authority of the Bible, not over the authority of the Bible. And we will not sacrifice truth for the sake of unity because we know that if we do, we will end up with neither. Those of us who support the GMC are sometimes called literalists or fundamentalists. No, we are Wesleyans. That means we believe the Bible is the Word of God and we need the great creeds of the church and the benefit of our intellect and the riches of our Christian experience to fully and rightly understand the Word of God. But we do believe the Bible is God's inspired and authoritative word. And if we don't like or get what it says, the problem is not with the Bible, it's with us. Are there some centrists and progressives who have a high appreciation for the inspiration and the authority of the Bible? Yes, there are. But you've heard enough in this video to know that if you stay in the UMC, there will be leading voices that deny that the Bible is a holy book, truly distinct and set apart from every other book, truly giving us God's mind and heart, truly trustworthy in all that it teaches, truly authoritative. And once that's gone, it will open the door to just about anything that progressive pastors and bishops believe makes sense to them and goes along with human experience. And it will not be long before many join that pastor from the Midwest to say, we don't go back to the Bible for the last word on anything. In the Global Methodist Church's Book of Doctrines and Discipline, you'll read, quote, the canonical books of the Old and New Testament as specified in the Articles of Religion or the primary rule and authority for faith, morals, and service against which all other authorities must be measured. What is the Bible and the Global Methodist Church? It's our rule. It's our authority for the Christian life. It is our canon, our measuring rod. And all claims about spiritual and moral truth must be measured against its teaching and its authority. If you want to be in a church that believes the Bible is God's word, 
you will be very comfortable in the Global Methodist Church. And I believe you will become very uncomfortable in the future United Methodist Church. Please join me for our next video, The Differences Within the United Methodist Church Regarding Our Lord and Savior, Jesus.